A ball given a push inside an aluminum ring rolls around inside the ring. When it reaches this gap, which path will the ball follow? Will it follow this path, this path, or this path? The ball follows a straight line in the same direction it was moving at the point of escape. Its path is tangent to the circle at that point. And then the other thing it said was that the motion is tangent to the circular path. So let's look at that. So an object moving in a circle, such as this ball on a string, at all times the velocity is tangent to the circular path. Tangent meaning the line that it's only one point on the circle. So as this moves around, the direction of the arrow changes, and the direction of the arrow is always tangent to the circle. So here I have a ball on a string, and I'm going to spin it around. It's going in a circle Y. Well, what, because I'm spinning it, but why am I able to spin it? It's attached to the string, right? Now, if I wanted to let go so that the ball flies off and hits that wall, hits the flag, let's say, when do I let go? Where's the ball going to be when I let go, when I just open my fingers and let it fly off? Where's the ball going to be? At the top, right? So well, basically, I want the ball to come around. And when it gets to the very top, I want to let go. And then it should travel off in the way it was moving at that instant. So I'll try. It's difficult to do. I can get it sometimes. Sometimes I can. But hopefully you get the idea. So Pretty close. All right. One now if I wanted to take the ceiling, <laughs> yeah, where do I let go? And when it's over here, right, at this position. There you go. Okay, so it's going to go off tangent to the circle whenever I let go. Now, the time to go around once, okay, we're going to give it a variable, capital T. The capital T stands for the period of the motion. Lowercase t, we know, is a time interval, right? Delta t, lowercase, is a, a measured time interval. This is capital T because it, it describes a very specific interval of time, that being the time to go around once. So we give it the, the name of peri a period. And it has the units of seconds, and that's the second per revolution. Now, this ball also goes a distance, right, in a period. So it goes around one time in a circle. But how far does it go? What would I need to do to be able to figure out how far it actually goes in one period? In other words, what distance does it? Diameter times pi, right? Or radius times pi. So I can measure the distance from my hand to the center of the ball. That's the radius. And so we know 2 pi r describes the circumference. So that would be the circumference of this circle. So that's the distance it went. And the capital T is the amount of time it took to do that. So we have 2 pi r is the delta d. Capital T is the time, and now we know the equation for speed. So we would do 2 pi r over the period, and then we can calculate how fast the ball is actually going. Just make sure we understand why the answer is about 25. So 2 pi r over t is our equation. 2 pi r is 0.29 meters. Now the period t, what's given is, we know we want this to be in seconds. Now we're told it goes 830 revolutions every minute. So that is not the period. Right? The period is how much time for one revolution. This is the same as saying 830 revolutions in 60 seconds. That's still not the time for one revolution. But if we did 60 seconds over 830 revolutions, so we could just flip it, we would get the amount of seconds for one revolution. And so you get 0 0.072 seconds per revolution. So that's that's your period. So 0 0.072, and you get about 25 meters per second. Okay. This type of motion is called <coughs> uniform circular motion. It's circular because it's in a circle. Uniform meaning it has a constant speed, so the speed doesn't change, and the radius is fixed. 
So for those two reasons, constant speed and fixed radius, we'll call it uniform circular motion. Is an object experiencing uniform circular motion accelerating? So it's not getting faster, it's not getting slower. It's just changing direction, and therefore it's accelerating. Look at this ball on the string. Same idea, right? It's not rolling, but it's, it's moving in a circle because it's being pulled towards my finger, which is the center of the circle at all times. So this thing is accelerating, but its direction of its acceleration is actually towards the center of the circle. Perpendicular to its velocity, right? Tan there's the tangent. If it's here, it's moving tangent, but the acceleration is that way. It's perpendicular. So that type of acceleration is called centripetal because the word centripetal means center seeking towards the center. Don't guess, reason it out. Well, I mean, I have reasoning, but it's still a guess. So V is constant. So when is the acceleration greater? Smaller circle, right? So the smaller turn requires greater acceleration. So the greater the turn, or the, the, the tighter the turn, the greater the acceleration. So that force, just as the acceleration is directed towards the center, and we call it centripetal acceleration, the direction of the force also needs to be the center. You saw that with the pool ball, right, the billiard ball. So the net force, as it's directed towards the center, we give it the name centripetal. It's not a special type of force, it's just a special direction. Any force could actually give a centripetal force. What's providing the centripetal force in this case? What, what force specifically? What? Who said it? Garrett? Who said it? Did you say anything? I said the string. The string? What, what force does the string apply? It's the name we have for that type of force. Tension, right? Tension force. If the moon is going around the earth, what is the source of the centripetal force? Earth's gravity, right? The ball on the ring, the ring was providing it. There was a contact force. So any type of force could be directed towards the center, centripetal. These, it's not limited to these three. I'm just giving you an example. All right, so let's say that we are driving on a road. <coughs> I'm approaching this turn. Right, so let's say that this is one of your tires. Right? So I don't think I have anything to represent a tire. You can imagine, right, that if you were looking down on the road, that's what your tire would look like to you, right? So your tire is rotating like this. So you're going straight. Now, to, go, to make the turn, what do you do? Turn your wheel. And that turns your tire that way. Now, what does your tire and car actually want to do? They want to just keep going straight. So you turn the wheel. That's not why you go. I mean, it is, but if without friction, you would turn your tire and you would just keep going straight. right? So what happens is you turn your tire, and now the friction force, so the tire is trying to skid along the road, if there's enough static friction, the tire can't slide, and therefore it's being actually pushed by friction this way. And, and so as long as the tire's turned that way, that force, it keeps trying to slide that way, the force keeps pushing it towards the center, and you go around the turn. Okay, so that's why like, if there's ice, like there's no friction. So you exactly. Straight, you right, so when there's ice, you just keep going. F equals ma. And we're going to substitute centripetal acceleration in there. And by doing that, we get an equation to calculate the centripetal force. The, the Newton's second law for circular motion is F equals mv squared over R.